Larry Kudlow Absolutely. is here. You're, My good friend. <laughs> we're, we're, we're putting the mic on you, Larry. We're, we're not even waiting till you're officially ready to go. Let me... Uh... Say hello to my dear friend Dan Clifton, who's the smartest policy guy in Washington, D.C. Congratulations, Larry. I may have Larry. to call him for a little help. I may have to call you for a little help, buddy. Dan, Dan you thank you very much, Larry. Larry. Which camera am I on? You're, well, Larry, Larry let us here. say con okay. congratulations thank you. to thank you. you. Appreciate talk, it. Talk us through what's unfolded the last couple of weeks. When did the president first get in touch with you? When did he formally offer you the role, and, and what was your immediate reaction? Well, and that last one's easy. My immediate action was, yes, honored to take the job, uh, which was last night. Um, in an Uber? Actually, it started on Fifth Avenue because I was at Cipriani's for one of our John Katz dinners. John and Margot, Judy and Larry, Mark Simone and Alex Priate. We have them all the time. So the phone rang, and of course, the place is packed, and, and one of his uh, military adjutants said, you know, president's calling. So I walked outside. We started the conversation on Fifth Avenue. It was very cold, by the way. Then I got in an Uber because I had to the, get... The weather was cold, not the president. The president was great. <laughs> uh, talk about that in a moment. And I had to get uptown to do the John Bachelor show like I do, every, I don't know, 15 some odd years every Tuesday night for an hour. And um, so, so for we the were talking. earlier who suggested that you, the 10 to 12 hours would be more work than you're accustomed to. Oh, <laughs> how unfair. 10 to 12 yeah. hour days all the time. So tell us about the conversation. You know, I used to anchor twice on this <laughs> network in this uh, for a long time i did the 11 to noon and i come back at seven i'm i'm ready i'm playing a strong game of tennis and i anyway. hope you'll continue to be joining us regularly as well uh, exclusively right you're not going on these other lair come on you know all these other tv nope nope you gotta stick well you have a contract don't you kelly don't you? whatever you want is, that's my <laughs> but great look, i pleasure. interrupted you so continue to tell us about you know what the president offered you um, and what you expect you'll be able to do in this role. Well, look, um, he called me Sunday afternoon. I was up in Connecticut. I just finished playing tennis. And I thought he was going to call me to bowl me out because I had some problems with the across-the-board tariffs, as you know. And, but he didn't, actually. He called and started explaining his position to me, his thinking on the matter, which I want to get to in a minute because it's not quite what people think it is. Um, and then we got into the conversation and he started talking about the NEC director job. And that's when I realized that, that that was what this was really going to be about. And he was wonderful. I mean, one of the, listen, I've been around a while. My head is not turned easily. I've served in the White House, et cetera, et cetera. But just to talk to him for 30, 40 minutes at a clip, uh, three, four days in a row, it was a wonderful thing. I just want to say that. It's a wonderful thing. And he and I have known each other many years. I've interviewed him on radio and TV. I was in the campaign helping out. I know him, you know, reasonably well. And um, it was just a terrific experience. Mm -hmm. I don't want to sound sophomoric, but it was just a really good thing. But, but Larry, we want to dive into the differences yes. on protection in a moment. But, but multiple 30, 40 minute phone conversations you've had in the last week. Yes. Sum us up for us how the president is at the moment, because a lot of people are framing this as what has been a chaotic or, or a very volatile couple of weeks. How is he doing personally? Sounded great. Sounded great. I will see him tomorrow. I'm going down tonight and we've got all kinds of things to do. He sounded great. And um, look, the economy is starting to boom. The tax cuts are working. The deregulation is working. We're going to get on the infrastructure. Uh, yeah, we're going to get on the trade also. Uh, he's completely in command. And as he always does, not only does he explain stuff he's thinking, but he asks questions. This is an old thing between us, and he asks good questions. So if I try to, you know, give him the Cudlow, the Cudlow thing, <laughs> he's going to come back, and, and he's a smart man. So I, look, I haven't been in the White House uh, as a staffer, you know, so I can't tell you what all goes on there, but I didn't hear any of that from him. So Dan Clifton, one of the reasons why we were talking to him is he said, now that the tariff number looks like it could be $60 billion, um, that would do more to offset the impact of tax cuts. In fact, these, you know, these are Which often... Which tariff number is So it? this is the tariff number that was reportedly Robert Lighthizer brought him $30 billion worth of tariffs on China across things like toys or tech, other industries, and the president said it wasn't enough. Now the reported number is more like $60 billion. Strategic's concern is, look, now these numbers are starting to add up to something that could hurt growth more substantially and undermine the benefit of the tax cuts that we know you love so much. What is your message going to be to the president on this? 
Well, I'm not. I'm a little unsure about these numbers. I'm not privy to these numbers. I, I did talk to Bob Lighthizer at some length today. He's an old friend of mine. So I, I can't really comment on that. I will say this. China has not played by the rules for a long time. I've talked about that. Uh, intellectual property rights, corporate technologies, other barriers, uh, transshipments to get around things. So China needs a comeuppance on trade. I'm so, I, I believe that. Now, we're just looking, Larry, at these live pictures of President Trump at the at the Boeing plant as well, which we'll keep looking at the pictures for now. And we also just had a statement, Larry, from the White House, from Sarah Sanders, saying Larry Kudlow was offered and accepted the position of assistant to the president for economic policy, director of the National Economic Council. Of course, uh, we already knew that, Larry, because you've uh, confirmed that to us. But uh, well, actually, official, was, official confirmation. It, Congratulations again. Thank you. Uh, by the way, it was out. I didn't know that. I wasn't watching TV this morning. And the president called, and he said, uh, it's out, because I don't think he was intending to put it out till tomorrow, Friday. And um, I said, oh. And he said, you're on, you're, you're on, you're on the air. And, and he said, I'm looking at a picture of you. And he said, very handsome. <laughs> so Trumpian. Uh, so Larry, clearly, he, he's there at the Boeing plant now. Uh, Boeing is down significantly today, 2.5%. Over the last five days, it's down 5%. Airbus, its rival, flat over that period. We know he looks at the stock market. Do you think he'll be looking at the reaction to Boeing's stock price today, listening to people there uh, at the plant and thinking, gosh, maybe tariffs on China is not the right move because they can retaliate and it can hurt American companies like Boeing? Well, we will see. Uh, I must say, as someone who doesn't like tariffs, I think China has earned a tough response, not only from the United States. I mean, I would, a, a thought that I have is that the United States could lead a coalition of large trading partners and allies against China or to let China know that they are breaking the rules left and right. That's the way I'd like to see it. You could call it a sort of trade coalition of the willing. And I, I, I can't comment on specific numbers. I don't think those numbers have much to do with us. I don't know where they come from. I mean, my problem with the steel and aluminum tariffs, as they were originally announced, is that it, it might do harm to American uh, users of steel and aluminum. I made that point on the air. I made it to him and consumers, ultimately. But what's happening is on that, and this is a very important thing, the end of last week, he started up with the carve-outs, the exclusions. Canada, Mexico, perhaps Australia. Now, were we, were we on Friday? I think we, I, I think, talked about I this. I think we were. And I said to you that I was relieved because I, I just don't like blanket tariffs and I don't think you should punish your friends to try to punish your enemies in international affairs. And that's where he went. So on Radio Saturday, I applauded the carve-outs. And in talking to him in recent days, uh, Europe can get carve-outs if they negotiate with us to reduce some of their barriers. They have many barriers. Uh, ditto for Japan. Uh, China, I don't know. Maybe China will negotiate in good faith. We will see. But regarding our tax rates, no, I, I, don't, I don't think our economy is threatened yet. Uh, and even if the worst case had gone through, I don't think it would have had. My, my problem is the principle of the thing. I just don't like blanket tariffs. I prefer, as look, I was talking to Speaker Paul Ryan today at some length about this. We, we supply siders, have always said, if you must, at least target them specifically. That will work. Reagan, we had, what, motorcycles? We had in chips, cars. as I recall. Actually, we spoke to David Stockman, Colorful your TV. boss, oh, last I know, hour. I know, I know. And he had some interesting things to say about this. He said he sees you in this position as a heads, Trump wins, tails, Trump loses. Maybe I wrote that down wrong. His point was, the president's going to win no matter what layer. You could end up being the fall guy. He said the president is an incorrigible, lifelong protectionist. People are delusional if they think he's going to change or if anything will change on trade outcomes. That Trump is a 17th century mercantilist in a time warp. And that Gary Cohn's departure was his acknowledgement that, that there was nothing anybody could say or Look, do to, to change the course of that outcome. For 35 some odd years, my friend Dave Stockman has been a sky is falling guy. No matter what happens, he's pushing his agenda. He's never met Donald Trump. Uh, he, he's annoying about it. I love Dave. I love Jennifer. Uh, I worked for him for three, three and a half years. It wasn't easy. Um, 
Dave's entitled to his opinions, all right? I don't have to agree with those opinions. And I, I don't want to go any further because I never get, per I don't want to get personal. Is it official? Do we, what do we call you, Mr. Director? You just call me Larry. Call it's perfectly Larry. okay. Um, you know, I brought her to the network. Let's be very clear. <laughs> she was one of my greatest guests with ratings through the roof on the Cuddle Report. you see the emails right now from people who want to offer you their congratulations. Mahabha, and Larry, and and I'm many so others. thrilled uh, for you. God bless all of them. We and one night she's on and Nick Diogan comes down. He never no comes down to, to the set. Right now. And, and he's you. taken her away from me. I can see it. Let me read you a statement from CNBC chairman yes. Mark Hoffman. Yes. Uh, here's what he had to say. Larry is a thoughtful, tenacious, and gracious gentleman who possesses an encyclopedic knowledge of markets, economics, and public policy. He has the unique ability to make the most complex concepts comprehensible and accessible. Larry's been part of the fabric of our CNBC since our founding in 1989. We thank him for his many contributions and wish him well. Thank you. Uh, and Larry, I talked to Mark today. It's extremely kind. Um, the last 20 years, 25 years of my life has been tied up with CNBC, which changed my life, changed my profession, um, and has been a family to me. And however this thing works out, it will be God's will. Uh, if there's an opportunity when my service is complete, uh, I hope very much to come back and help CNBC. It, it is my family, and it has changed my life. And it's uh, CNBC also years back gave me a second chance after my crash and burn. Uh, it was Ron and Sana and, and, and Bill Griffith. And the next thing I knew, I was in the rotation. And the next thing I knew, one night I was sitting on the air with Jimmy Kramer. We didn't know what we were doing, but I loved the guy. And um, it was wonderful. So I, I, I love this place. I, I'm honored. I'm honored to take this position. The hardest part about it is a I won't be here three, four days a week anymore. Well, Larry, so many of us at CNBC echo Mark Hoffman's words, and uh, you know you are an inspiration to all of us. Now you get a chance to make a difference for many, many more people. Yes. How much of an honor is that for you now? It's an enormous honor. Um, my life has had twists and turns, and um, as people know, uh, you know, with God's grace, I'll have 23 years clean and sober in the next couple of months. That made it all possible. And wonderful people like you and Kelly and Mark Hoffman and Nick Dioga and everybody else here, the whole newsroom, it's just, um, I love it. But there are greater responsibilities. I'm aware of that. Um, I, I believe I am up to the task. I've got a lot of energy. And, um, Listen, people are lucky if they get a second act in life, Larry. I this know. is what, th third, fourth for you? I mean, <laughs> And, and the you know, best the kind yet. of hope that people, who's, anyway. Who's counting? Listen, the president, we're, we're going to hear from the president, possibly himself as well. He is in St. Louis. He's touring a Boeing factory, and that is a fascinating backdrop uh, right now as the main uh, issue of contention for the markets is the direction of these tariffs. So uh, just one final point that, that David Stockman made. He said he thinks, Larry, that you are the kind of guy who just wants to do whatever it takes to keep stocks rising. Now, people say that about the president as well. And they're all looking at the tariff policy through the lens of, is it helping or hurting companies like Boeing? Is it helping or hurting stocks? What do you think? Uh, look, in terms of my economic philosophy or views, it's no secret I'm a disciple of Arthur Laffer and Robert Mundell and some others, uh, Steve Forbes, Steve Moore. Look, I want to make it really simple. Mr. Stockman notwithstanding. I believe, first of all, that the greatest and most important thing for this or any other country is rapid economic growth and prosperity for everyone. That is my basic view, and it has been for four decades. Second, there are ways to do it. I don't believe in secular stagnation. We go through slumps in this country. Good policies always help. Ultimately, it's the genius of our American businessmen and women and our Constitution and our rule of law. But if you keep tax rates minimal, if you keep regulations and government spending minimal, if you keep the dollar sound and steady, you are going to have a terrific economy. If government has a modest approach and lets people do what they need to do and allows the freedom to do it, mm -hmm. we will do great in this country. We are already, I believe, on the front end of a tremendous investment boom. Um, Numbers are going to come out over time. 
That's, that's my philosophy. Whether that, look, I'm, I love the stock market. I love wealth. I think, I think rising stocks helps everybody, all right? And let me finish this point. Many of the people who are critical of me or the president's uh, tax cuts are the very people who are being helped the most. For example, um, my friends in the uh, union movement, mm -hmm. teachers union, government workers, they hate this stuff. Well, you know what? The lower tax rates and the faster economic growth and the better profits is the only hope they have of ever seeing their pensions. So don't tell me it doesn't help everybody, because it does. And in fact, I know people are nagging and complaining to me about the uh, salt tax on state and local governments. Okay, we'll figure that out over time. But you know what? I'm going to say, as I have, everybody is going to benefit from a boom. Everybody. You know why? I, I say to my friends, uh, wealthy people in the suburbs or the city, your business is going to improve. Here's a question your order from book is going to improve. Larry, You're going to be better point. off He's everywhere. Big time investor I asked, I said, what, what would you want to ask Larry Kudlow right now? And he said, if you could wave a magic wand, what is one incremental policy that would ensure a higher long-term growth rate? What would you do? Is it infrastructure? Or no. are you not so keen on that? What is it that I'm would be on. that one thing? I'll just say it in a little phrase. Lower tax rates and sound Personal money. Personal tax rates? Personal, corporate. Lower tax rates and sound, stable dollar. If you have that combination, as Brian Dimitrovic and I wrote in our book, JFK and the Reagan Revolution, when that model has been tried under JFK and under Reagan, it's worked fabulously. And I'll even give you Bill Clinton. You think Trump's going to embrace a strong dollar? What, is, what would that look like? Are you going to? I have no reason to. Have I to have no reason to believe. President Trump opposes this. sound and stable dollar. A great country needs a strong currency. He knows that. I have no reason to believe uh, he doesn't favor a sound and strong and steady. I'm not saying the dollar has to go up 30 percent. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying let the rest of the world know that we are going to keep the world's international reserve currency steady. That creates confidence at home and confidence overseas. I have no reason to believe the president disagrees with that view. What does it mean for the deficit? Will you, are you willing to let the deficit rise in the short term? To, I have to. To what sort of level? I have to. Uh, that's the way this crazy static scoring is in Washington, D.C. I don't believe a word of it. I, look, I was the numbers guy at OMB for three years. I heard the same thing when Reagan cut tax rates, okay? Short run, yes, you're going to get a deficit. But look, let me look. So you're running a business. You're running a business. And you see investment opportunities to expand your business, machinery, equipment, training, hire, whatever. So you'll go out and borrow in the short run in order to expand the business over time. That's the way it works. If you're borrowing to, to, to finance current services or day to day expenditures, you've got problems. If you're borrowing to have greater investment, literally, we are investing in America with these lower tax rates and the sound money and making sure we look after our interests overseas. That's Larry, the best possible you, thing. The best have, possible thing. What kind of conversations have you had with Gary Cohn? It sounds like he might stick around for part of this transition. I hope he does. I have talked to Gary almost daily. He is wonderful. He has been a great help to me. At, at one point, I asked him, I called him one day as we were going through this. I said, Gary, this is a really dumb question, but look, what do you do? What's your day like? What do you do? <laughs> and he laughed. He said, no, that's actually quite a good question. So are you moving to Washington? Uh, yes. Oh, yes, absolutely. Tonight? Uh, well, I don't, we won't move lock, stock, and barrel. We're going down in there, Judy and I. Uh, yes, this is a 24-7 type Did Gary job. have any, any cautionary advice for you? What not to do? Who not to tangle with? You know, does he say, hey, my plan was working perfectly until Rob Portman left and Peter Navarro walked into the Oval Office? <laughs> Um, you know, I have only really good things to say about Mr. Cohn, who I think he was, he and Steven Mnuchin were so instrumental in this tax cut, it's unbelievable. Mm -hmm. It changed everything. And they're working with Congress and they're working with the public. You, you, you heard me a few times support their point of view. I have nothing but good things to say about Gary Cohn and I have nothing but good things to say about Steve Mnuchin. And this pro-growth would never have happened without President Trump. People told me during the campaign, oh, don't believe him, he's using you, whatever that means. I said, what? I just saw him. We're talking about nothing. Trump was the last guy in Washington, except when I went down on the train, to argue for a 15% corporate tax rate. And he got it done. This is after the health care thing fell apart. It could Navarro, not have quickly. Peter Navarro is a good friend of mine. I talked to him today or yesterday at some length. He was a regular on the Cudlow Report for many years. He's a good friend. We agree on some things and we disagree on some things. And let me say, if you know me, policy disputes are great. 
I never and never will make it personal. Never. He's a smart guy. As I say, we will have our agreements and we will have our disagreements. My friend Wilbur Ross has been helping me on this. Same thing. Wilbur said to me, Larry, all I ask is that when the decision is made by the president, we then move on to the next issue. Mm -hmm. And I said, Wilbur, you have my word. You have my word. That's the way. You know, I want to set up, by the way, or strengthen a process so that when decisions are made, we devote our time and our discipline to uh, executing the president's policy desires. That's the way this should work. I've had experience in this area years ago with Reagan, and I followed it very closely during the Bush years. Is Peter Navarro going to report to you now, or that's over? I, I, now I, I, I don't know anything about that. I'm just only because you bring up the process. In, I didn't know if you meant that that was... In was my personal. mind, Peter Navarro is an equal. Okay, whatever the flow chart may or may not say, I haven't gotten that far. Uh, by the way, I'm a good bureaucrat, always have been. I'm a process guy, I'm a policy guy. That's why the president said to me, and other friends of mine said, you have been working 40 years for this. And the president said to me, this is the job you wanted. And I said, yes, sir, it is. 25 of and those I asked him, here at I asked him, that's correct, by the way. Um, three years at the Fed, uh, 10 years as the chief economist at Bear Stearns, um, other activities around. This, by yeah. the way, the 10-year uh, anniversary of Bear Stearns uh, going bust, which I is read a side the point. article La with great interest. <laughs> Larry, the, uh, the, um, Gary Cohn, back to him. Yes. He was seen as someone who linked CEOs, linked biz the business world with the administration. Is that something you see as a, a role you'll have to take Absolutely. on? Have CEOs rung you already? Have you spoken to any in particular? Uh, some. Uh, there's a, a laundry list, according to our front office, of people that want to talk to me. I want very much to do it. I want to follow in Gary's footsteps. I think that's extremely wise. Uh, I did some of that years ago with Reagan. I was kind of a business guy from Wall Street. Um, yes, must do that. You, it's not a consensus thing. It's, it's the president's desire and his senior staff to let folks know what we're doing and why we're doing it. And I know there are agreements and disagreements, but to me, transparency is a very important principle, particularly nowadays, you know, with all the high-tech communication. You can't hide anything, nor should you. So I look forward to meeting with all of them. Uh, Jamie Dimon, who was a friend of mine, apparently called somebody and said, could I have Kudlow's number? Uh, I, the only thing I didn't like about it is I thought he had my number. If you write uh, it down, I'll send it to him. Now, you, he's a wonderful... I, I, listen, I'll give him everything in the world as long as he buys me dinner at Vico. That's our local watering hole <laughs> on the Upper East Side. I'm sure he'll be willing to, to do that. <laughs> Just to back to Gary Cohn one last time. Yes. Clearly he had big disagreements at times with the president, ultimately led to his departure. Do you fear that? Uh, and what's the sort of tenure that you're hoping for in this Actually, role? One I, year? Three full years, oh, I, seven years? I couldn't possibly. I, look, I wouldn't have told you six days ago that I'd be <laughs> talking about this. Um, look, I've known the president a long time. Uh, we have mutual admiration society. He is the president. So it's a different role, and I will abide by that. There may be agreements. There may be disagreements. We'll talk it through. But as I said, once decisions are made, that's it time to execute. The president is going to begin speaking, we believe, uh, in St. Louis at that Boeing plant within a, a, just about a minute or two. Good. Will you stick around? Yes, I'd like to hear your to. thoughts uh, about what he has to say there. I'm interested in what he says. <laughs> you don't know already? I mean, are, are you going to be giving him, what do you expect to be giving him direction on matters like this? I will certainly give him the best advice I can. And um, working with my pal Kevin Hassett at CEA, we're, gonna, we're numbers people. We make assertions, but we're numbers people, and the president deserves the best information he can get. Let me ask you something uh, on the Pennsylvania election results real quickly. Uh, a district that Trump won by 20 points looks like it's a dead here, or maybe the Democrats just have won at this point. And uh, strategist Dan Clifton, who we had just said on as well, says a wave election is coming in the fall. How is that going to complicate things for the White House, or does it just take policy? And Look, if they're the biggest supporters of the president's tariffs, Elizabeth Warren is more in his corner. President, by the way, the inner polls show he still has a 20-point lead in that district. Uh, I don't want to go in. It's, it was a close race, and the, let the best person win, so I, I can't tell that. I, I don't want to anticipate stuff. Um, you know me. I'm an optimist. Is it, I just wonder, is it going to drag him in more of that tariff direction, which is the one place you guys have a core disagreement? I'm an optimist. I believe in growth. So does he. And I think this country is going to have a great run here. We've been a little slow. I think I just think this is the greatest country in the world, and we will produce the best economy in the world. That's what our history tells us. And the president, you said when you've spoken to him over the last uh, few days, wasn't in, in a negative mood, despite perhaps he was in a great this, mood. This mood. Yeah. We, we had great jokes going back and forth. He was kidding me about stuff. It was great. <laughs>
You know, to know him is, I just have to tell you this, is a lot different than what some people mm -hmm. have. What is your reaction to that and how achievable is that before the midterms? Well, I, I've heard the same thing, so I'll confirm everything Elon said. Um, very important, a lot of people, Kevin Brady, everybody, President, uh, make the individual tax cuts permanent. They kind of had to fiddle with them because of these goofy static scoring models that never work. But so they're not going to care about the cost? They're just going to make it permanent? Look, we'll see. I don't know. Um, these costs are... Look, can we please use dynamic scoring? You and just know, so like everyone knows what you're talking about, the, the difference in the scoring, the static scoring basically just says you take the cost of this program and there you have it. The dynamic scoring says you take the cost, but then you say, okay, well, but if the economy grows right. three or right. upwards of 3%, right. then we can tweak these projections so that it doesn't look as costly. And you want to see the latter happen. Uh, indeed. I mean, actually... Um, the critics will say the problem is then you can just plug in a 4%, a 5%, a 10% growth number, and everything looks like it's coming up roses. Well, it's better than plugging in a 1.5% number, I'll say that. It looks some American history would prove otherwise. Um, if... Plug in 3%. I don't care. Plug in 35 it looks much better. Individuals deserve a permanent break. That's very important. Elon's right. Um, I'll add some more to it. Um, talk about uh, capital gains, possibly lowering the rate, but possibly indexing them for inflation, which is something many of us have argued for years. We index the individual code for inflation uh, because of the 70s experience. We don't index capital gains because you're paying taxes on illusionary or inflationary uh, profits, which is unfair to investors, and it's really anti-entrepreneurship. Uh, and the other thing I know about, and I, have t I, I tried to get hold of Kevin Bray this morning, but we could. Um, let's really help the small businesses on this. The small business portion, the 20% deduction and so forth, it's still very complicated and opaque. The rules have not been fully written yet. Um, point of people in agriculture, for example, are very concerned about that. Uh, so I, I think we need to give them some help, and it should be very positive help. It shouldn't be punishing them. Small business is very important. Can phase two include a broader cut again of the corporate tax rate, or are we, we, we there? Where I don't expect. I hate to say I don't expect it. I mean, you're talking. I, look, I want 15% corporate rate. It's 21. Uh, but no, I don't think so. Not this time around. Uh, but the key here with all the politics and so forth, if the economy is growing as we expect it to grow, mm -hmm. that's a terrific thing for Mr. Trump to run on and for the Republican Party to run on. But there has to be good messaging on this. If I have any fault with the White House, I don't think they've had enough Kudlowian, you know, really hammer this thing in. My man, you know, go for it. You got a pretty good product. The polls show it's popular. The more people know it, the more people like it. So get out there and push. Is that your first agenda item, to, to make the most of the tax cuts the administration has already passed to show what the benefits are to everyone? It's going to be one of them. It's going to be one of them. The president, president likes me uh, as a media communicator, so I will be more than happy to Like oblige. I said, it's going to be hard for us if you're going and communicating anywhere else, any other platform, I Larry. But, I, understand. Uh, I understand. No, let's bring in Elon Moy. She has a little bit more for us on what phase two may look like. Elon? Yeah, I think the question here is whether this is going to be a policy proposal or a political proposal. Democrats have already put out their own plan for what a uh, tax bill would look like post-2018. It includes raising the corporate rate to 25 percent, reinstating things like the alternative minimum tax for individuals and for corporations. And so now you're seeing Republicans start to hit Democrats on their plan going forward, but they also want their own plan going forward. They don't want to just run on past accomplishments. So I think that what you'll see in a phase two is really something that is more geared toward uh, 2018 midterm uh, messaging rather than something that's going to actually pass before November. Well, look, um, Elon, I, there's always politics in this stuff. I get it. And your reporting is always great. But I will tell you this. Uh, Kevin Brady was really the instigator. And he sold President Trump on it. And then Trump acknowledged it at a meeting or a speech someplace. And when I've been talking to President Trump in recent days, he's referred to it a number of times. So I'll just say, I understand politics. It's an election year. But this, these will be serious proposals. Trust me. Whether they can get them through or not remains to be seen. They will be serious proposals. The, and the vehicle that they used to get the previous proposals through no longer exists. Well, we'll see. We'll see. Um, you, you can only take one bite out of the reconciliation apple. Well, so we'll see on that. There are other ways and means, pardon the phrase, to get that stuff uh, done. <laughs> Look, I, Larry, you're confirming a new line. reconciliation vehicle, a new budget proposal that could be used to pass tax well, reform, phase two? You know, 
I would get rid of the whole reconciliation process. I've said this to so many people down through the years. I think it's a pain in the butt. I don't think it makes any sense. I'd get rid of filibusters. I don't think that makes any sense. This is the 21st century. It's the information age, and they're behaving like it's the 1830s. So I'd get rid of all that stuff and just do a vote, up or down, 50 wins. 50 plus pence wins. Yeah, they're going to go. This Just White House it. guy is getting a little big for his bridge. No, there's he's nothing. He's telling us what to do in the Senate. He's this, changing. He's throwing policy out the window. Well, I, I talked to Mitch McConnell about this. <laughs> he's a wonderful man, great friend. Um, he has mixed opinions about my opinions. No. But I believe, that, I've said this before, I, I just think it's in something out of the 1830s, and we don't need it anymore if we ever needed it. Um, the other thing I want to say this, Democrats, I don't understand the Democratic Party. And let me just say, I am a former Democrat, okay? Let me just say, I think that some of the best Republicans were former Democrats. John F. Kennedy, about whom I wrote a book, is a former Democrat who cut taxes. There are pro-growth Democrats who wanted to cut the corporate tax rate big time. Um, I've talked to them, I know them, and they're being stifled by their leadership. And I just don't understand that party. How are you going to run on raising taxes? Would you explain that to me? If the tax cuts are working and popular, which is what the evidence shows and the polls show, how are they going to, let's tax rich people? They're going to you know? say, we're going to raise the taxes and we're going to use the money for infrastructure. Well, Dale's going to say, we'll raise the taxes and we'll spend and spend and spend on a whole bunch of things. And I don't think it's a winning message. I'm not going to predict the midterms here in March, but I'm just saying, I think the GOP, if it gets its message out, has much stronger ground on this election than ever before. I think phase two is a good idea. And by the way, Mr. Trump's defense of America regarding international trade, whatever the specifics turn out to be, is a very popular issue, a very popular issue. All right, you can go too far in that, I suppose, but he's a negotiator, and so far the returns on his are very good. I've heard your point of view about the tech piece of this. So it, this is now as the battlefront kind of moves to, to China and specifically targeting areas of abuse there, like uh, tech and intellectual property. Mm -hmm. Is that something that, look, no matter what the cost is, needs to be done, or is that something that threatens probably the most successful part of the U.S. economy, That's which correct. is these, these tech giants. That's correct. And, and therefore, I, I'm, if it comes to it, I am going to strongly favor targeted tariffs and tax increases on China until they come to the table sincerely not, and play ball with us. It's not just that, too. It's also this idea that maybe there wouldn't, that Chinese companies wouldn't be allowed to list on the New York Stock Exchange or that U.S. companies, look what happened with Broadcom and Qualcomm, could not have any Chinese investment. Are, are those reasonable measures? I wouldn't want to predict at this stage. Uh, and again, I, I don't like across the board tariffs. I think it's very unhealthy. But again, you know, in the history of history, targeted tariffs are sometimes very necessary. And the president and I have talked about this at some length in recent days, and he makes a persuasive case. Again, I don't want us to fight our allies. I want to settle the disputes, you know, uh, on the table with NAFTA and Europe and so forth and Japan. Uh, to me, that's the best way. And we mustn't shoot ourselves in the foot. Tariffs are, after all, taxes. But, 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 when things reach such an extreme point, as they have with China, American company goes to a province, and the provincial people force them to put all their plans on the table, including the technology. That's unheard of. And then Look you've at got even a, Apple, the concessions that one of our most important right. companies makes in terms of domiciling its technology there to appease That's the right. authorities. So you, you're right. You got these provincial guys. They're like they're like mobsters, like mafiosa. And you got to give them vigorous to get in in the first place. And then they steal your technology. And then they steal your property rights. That's really look as a free trade. That's got to change. And if, if Ms. Trump carries that forward. I cannot criticize that. All my free trade friends cannot criticize that. Is one of your biggest jobs there, therefore, to convince some of the CEOs who we've spoken about already who have come out and loudly criticized tariffs of any form? Because the argument you're making now sounds very sensible. We know there's been intellectual property stolen mm -hmm. uh, from China. It's been going on not just during this presidency, but the previous presidency. How do you argue to the CEOs that have come out pretty unilaterally, like Jamie Dimon we mentioned earlier, to say tariffs are a bad idea? Well, look, I'm, you know, again, I'm not in love with tariffs, don't get me wrong. Um, but, 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 I will be happy to sit down. And uh, this is going to be part of my, Gary Cohen established this as part of the NEC role. He was a genius at it, bringing business people in, very important. Trump himself has been very accessible to the business people. So I think that's good, and I'll carry that baton to the best of my ability. But, you know, there are going to be disagreements. I'm sorry, I get that. Um, so we'll see. Are you we'll bringing see. any people in of your own? Uh, at the moment, my biggest concern is keeping the staff. 
They have an excellent NEC staff that Gary Cohn put together. Uh, I know some of them quite well. Uh, I was metaphorically on my knees with one of them asking for her help. I, I won't mention uh, her name, Shahira Stewart, but she's a, she's a superwoman, and um, uh, she is going to stay and help out. I hope they all do. Is morale They're low terrific. because of what happened with Mr. Cohn? I don't know. It's a Why good... do they need such convincing is my question. I don't know. Sometimes you have these anxieties in life and it takes a seasoned old guy maybe to calm them down. <laughs> You know, Cone did a great job with that group. They performed very well, and I hope they stay. I mean, that's going to be my pitch. I may meet with some of them tomorrow or certainly in the coming days. I want them to stay. We may add some and so forth, but it's a good group, very good group. Of all the wars inside the administration, the NEC staff gets really high marks from everybody, which is amazing. Larry, what's your view? I mean, monetary policy is not for you to decide, but what's your view on inflation and uh, implications for, for the path of monetary policy? Stable dollar. Stable money, confident, reliable, strong, and stable. I call it the adjectives. The adjectives are very important in that game. <laughs> uh, I right now, Steve Moore and I had a piece in the journal yesterday or the day before. Growth does not cause inflation, okay? More people working, more people prospering. God forbid a blue collar worker should get a raise after not having one since 2000. I'm I mean, guessing you're on. not putting a bus to Phillips in your office. Uh, your uh, <laughs> look, even Phillips, the Phillips curve, he didn't say that. I wrote a little thing. You, know, you were saying he said about wages, but not about general That's inflation. That's right. Phillips said if the unemployment right, hold, rate goes down, wages go up. He never, he never said it was inflationary. We are, Just keep the dollar sound. The dollar? Yeah. Back in Davos, was yeah. it a mistake of Secretary Mnuchin to even give the possibility of interpretation that the Treasury Secretary doesn't want a strong dollar? He's in, he's in recovery right now. He's in recovery. <laughs> he's a very good friend of mine. Um, we texted back and forth. Uh, my, I, I call it the adjectives. Adjectives are very important in life. So strong, steady, reliable, consistent. Those are wonderful adjectives for a Treasury secretary. Um, Stephen Mnuchin knows Robert Rubin from Goldman Sachs. Robert Rubin, in my opinion, was a fabulous Treasury secretary because he made it very clear that their policies was for a steady and strong dollar in the nation's interest. And I'm not a believer in intervention, but every once in a while, mm -hmm. Rubin would do some dollar buying just to tell the short sellers you're on the wrong track, fellas. And I'm not an advocate. Long-term intervention does work, but you get my drift. But you're so leaving the door open to some short term. Keep the adjectives up. That's all I'll say. And, and Steve Mnuchin believes that. He's a strong dollar guy. He's a growth guy. Frankly, one of the most underrated people in the cabinet. I mean, he's worked wonders uh, on taxes and so forth. So, no, I, you may have to come and do something if it falls a lot. I don't hope. I hope that doesn't happen. The Federal Reserve may have to, uh, you know, raise the funds rate a wee bit. Okay, fine. But right now, let's just. I love it where it is, kind of like the X Y at 90. Let's call it. It got as high as 103. Somewhere's in there. Get the other. You know, it'd be great. Some Paul Volcker, I, very, my former boss at the New York Fed. Um, Volcker says one of the things we need to do is have a conference and an effort in the G20 now, not the G7, to enhance currency cooperation and stability worldwide. We do not want beggar thy neighbor policies. We do not want dollar wars. That's bad for everybody. And by the way, no one has ever devalued their currency into prosperity. So Volcker's idea of having a, a full-scale conference of currency reform, uh, I don't mean necessarily pegging rates. Just you know it when you see it. But we have to work together. I don't know why the G20 doesn't bring this up. They talk about everything. years ago, they got close. I mean, there were I know. a lot of with it. The now they're around and talking thing. about global climate warming and all this. <laughs> Just but everyone's the dollar. That's their like job. They're Great. finance ministers, the for God's sake. Because the other ones are getting a little stronger now. That's what makes it okay. From the that's last a very years. good point. No, no, you're absolutely right. And it's interesting in this dollar slide. In the, in this terrific point, Kelly. Uh, gold has not exploded upwards. Commodities have not exploded. Those would be serious inflation signals. So, to some extent, you're right. Europe is growing better. Japan is growing better, so their currencies are stronger. And I, I just, thank you for that. That's a terrific point. Uh, I'm going to sell that to Mr. Trump, make sure I give you full credit, as I always do. But you know, I just don't want to see the dollar really plunge. That would be bad. But so far, I'm okay with this story, and let's just keep up with it. Stepping away from the dollar, back to the stock market. Yes. Larry, two weeks ago or so, we were sat here, the three of us, asking you about the steel and aluminum tariffs the day they were put on. The market was falling pretty yes. sharply those yes. couple of days. And you said here on this set, 
that you were hoping the president was acknowledging the fall in the stock market. Mm -hmm. Clearly, since then, he's rolled them back a little bit. That's correct. Do you think that was because of the stock market fall? Did you speak to him specifically about that? How closely do you think he looks at the stock market as an indicator for whether his policies, his words, are the right things? I, I know he follows the market. Uh, we haven't spoken about the market in, in recent days. He does follow it, and he should follow it. I think the stock market is a pretty good indicator of the current future uh, economy. Look, I was very concerned. I mean, I was not a happy camper when the aluminum steel thing first broke because of its blanketness and because we seemed like we were punishing our friends. But he's, he's shifted, very important. And he, again, he's a negotiator. We don't have many presidents who are negotiators. You know who's a good negotiator? Once president of a union, Ronald Reagan. He knew how to use carrots and sticks. NAFTA, Mr. TPP, are those then uh, important objectives of yours? I, yes. I, we, we always talk in broad, broadly, Larry, with you about free trade. But, yes. you know, with those trade agreements being out there and with these possibly being negotiating chips, are you going to kind of push all of this towards a, an outcome where it's like, okay, we use these as bargaining tools so that we stay in NAFTA. I don't know if you think we need a better deal. Maybe we join a Trans-Pacific partnership. Well, look, um, it's the president's view that counts, and the president would much prefer to negotiate through NAFTA. Much prefer. And that's one of the reasons that he exempted Canada and Mexico, the two NAFTA partners, uh, because it was overdone. And, okay, I'm for NAFTA, but it's got to be fixed. It's really got to be reupholstered in many different ways. You've got tax issues, and you've got, uh, you've got internal regulatory issues. But the, our economies are completely integrated nowadays. So I don't think any, if we left NAFTA, I think it would have very bad consequences, to be perfectly honest. I think the president acknowledges that. And, and ba his, his, his basic point is, let's negotiate. And that's a good point for international trade. The other key point about permanence is I'd like to see the immediate investment expensing be made permanent. Hmm. It's got five-year window. But does that take the stimulus out of it? Because if no. there's no reason, if it's not going to sunset, then there's no urgency to do it now, or? No, it's just long term. That's our deal. That's the rule. And it makes our investment environment that much more hospitable for people at home and folks over abroad. abroad. Look, you know, Trump has always said this, and I agree. We want to make America the worldwide investment destination. We had that mantle, but we've lost it in recent years. Let's return it. We're more competitive with respect to taxes. We're more competitive with respect to regulations. Uh, we're more competitive. We can fix this broken international trading system, do it the right way, and hence, People will come to us. We want them to come to us. Companies that left us will come home. International companies that stayed away will come back, will come right in and build new stuff. That's a big part of the president's thinking, and he's right. I mean, literally, we're making America great. We're just saying, we're all, what did he say in Davos? Well, look we're, what's happened in Canada, where oh, they now, there's pressure on the prime minister there because suddenly their tax rates, which all the U.S. companies inverted to take advantage of, don't look as attractive. Pity. <laughs> now, I am told by important sources in the American government that Mr. Trudeau has been on the phone with the president, um, hand over fist, ag acknowledging concessions. I have a feeling story. your sources are, are good That's as well. It's a very good source. <laughs> it's one I've been speaking with um, in recent days. So I'm told that, and he told the same thing about Europe, but I will say this, this source is worried about the trade situation in Europe. The EU has very bad protectionist policies. They also have very bad tax policies. They have big vats. We have to pay the darn vets, and they sometimes have quotas on our cars. That's not right. We let them in. Uh, we welcome them in the South and so forth. Low tax states and right to work laws, that's great. Uh, the Detroit crowd should go south and have better state tax rates. That's a big point on our a, The EU has a 10% uh, import tax on U.S. cars. Right. Do you, does your source we don't. think that if that doesn't get retracted, that there'll be a reciprocal tariff put on European he's, cars? He's looking at it real closely. What He's looking we... at it real closely. It's a good Larry, question. And yeah, the answer is yes. Larry, if I, go ahead, Elon. If I could just jump in here, yes. you know, one of the big international questions in addition to tariffs that companies are facing is what happens with the international side of the tax code. It seems that many companies are still digesting all of the major changes, particularly on that complicated international side that were done in the last tax package. You know, are Republicans biting off more they, than they can chew with putting together yet another tax package before the last one is completely worked out? Well, you know, I, I think, you know, you just chew the whole peanut butter sandwich on this. In other words, you're going to have revisions to the individual code, revisions to the small business code. And I think you're quite right, by the way. Um, a lot of the international provisions, okay, 
you know, moving to uh, moving uh, away from the current situation uh, and, and being taxed only once. It's a little bit opaque, Elon. You know, you look at it. I tried to work through it with people. Um, it's not clear what all is in there. So um, we'll have to see. I just think it all goes together. If they come for a second package, you'll see it all bundled in together. And hopefully we'll abolish the filibuster rule. So you just need a simple majority to pass it. And America will grow. And we'll all be optimistic like Kudlow is. I am an optimist. You know that. I can't help myself. Larry, 1978, we believe this might have been your first uh, TV appearance uh, on NBC Nightly News. They dug it up for us. Let's have a watch. <laughs> That's awesome. The dollar market, the stock market, the gold market, the bond market are all very much related. These are markets made up of millions of people making individual assessments, individual decisions. And quite clearly, there is now a massive loss of confidence in the ability of the U.S. to handle its inflation problem over the next couple of years. Good point. <laughs> needed a haircut, but good point. Well, I had hair in those days. Your interviewer needed a, a you know, haircut more. No, that was, well, was, he was a good re business reporter in the days when business reporters were very scarce. And I can't, maybe they'll come to me. He was terrific. He was the only guy who cared. I, I'd go on the Today Show when, when Tom Brokaw was running it. And uh, I think Jane Pauley was running it. And we'd start talking about the economy, which was a big subject because it was all going to hell in a handbag with inflation and interest and whatnot. And I, I, Mike Jensen, some, that's it, home run. Mike Jensen, very nice guy. Haven't seen him in ages. Hope Larry, okay. you're such a pro that you're a guest, but with an earpiece as well. Are so you this, kidding? This is perfect. <laughs> Jason, is there anybody smarter than Jason? <laughs> anyway, the point is I try to get a message out on the economy. It wasn't easy. <laughs> Tom Brokaw has been a lifelong friend. I love the guy. Jane Pauley, I don't know so well, but I remember one time going up with all this crisis, and she's saying, well, it sounds like you know what you're talking about. I'm not quite sure. And I looked over and said, well, that's because you really don't know what I'm talking about. Um, was that the last time you were ever on that program? There was a hiatus of several years. <laughs> yeah, the decades. cast changed, and I was welcomed back. You're brave for bringing it up Well, again. I was sort of annoyed, OK? You know? Now, nowadays, everybody covers everything in business. But, and but to your it's point, wonderful. communication still is one of the first things That's you want right. to emphasize in there. What is that going to look like? Are, are you going to get out there and do, you know, uh, we, we, what, pick a platform, radio, you have TV, you have Twitter, you have the web. Is there going to be a concerted effort or is it just I'm available, I want to talk about this and tell everybody what we're trying to do? Well, I'm available. There's no question about that. Um, I love radio. One of, one of the hardest parts of this is I'm going to have to give up my radio show for a while. Um, I love TV. Uh, I tweet, constantly tweet. I haven't in recent days because I've been locked up on uh, Rikers Island, but when I get my feet back on the ground, I'll be able to start tweeting again and giving opinions like we are tonight, which is fabulous. Um, so everything, everything. Look, the tweeter in chief knows a lot about communications. Like we want, we want to echo our congratulations. Lots of people have been mentioning it, including, in fact, you mentioned you haven't been able to speak to him yet. Jamie Dimon says, Godspeed, my friend. Mm -hmm. He's looking forward to talking to you. You're a wonderful man. S sum up for us the last 30 seconds how much this means to you, this new role. Um, it's my life. It's my career. It's my profession. And I've trained a long time for it. And um, I've been in the economics game a long time in different areas. And I'm proud of that. And the president has given me a chance. I love it. I'm honored by it. I'm honored to serve my country. That's a great dream. Um, and I'll work like heck to get it done. I really will. Thank How long you. do we have to wait for 3% growth? Better? Uh, week, Quarter? week after next. <laughs> week after <laughs> next. Easy. Larry, a pleasure. Thank you Thank so you. much. Thank so you very, very much, much for all your time. It. Hey there. Thanks for checking out CNBC on YouTube. Be sure to subscribe to stay up to date on all of the day's biggest stories. You can also click on any of the videos around me to watch the latest from CNBC. Thanks for watching.